Very good. All right, guys. All right, everybody. Are we live? Is it working? It look, okay, there we go. It's working. Excellent. I'm going to give everybody a couple of minutes to uh, catch up to us, to get here. Uh, I am in, I wanted to let you guys know that uh, I am in the process of moving. I am, uh, we're packing stuff up and getting ready to go. We were actually supposed to start yesterday and uh, it didn't happen because of the blizzard here. Uh, but that's going to be happening over the next uh, couple of weeks. So I may have to take a few chunks of days off where you might not hear from me for a few days because I will be moving from the top of Manhattan down to the bottom of Manhattan. Hi, guys. Uh, and once we do start talking, I'm going to give everybody a couple of minutes to get here. But once we actually do start talking, um, I am going to uh, cover the comments up so that I don't get distracted um, and forget what I'm talking about. But while we're giving everybody time to get here, uh, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. One is something we covered on uh, the class on tarot uh, last week. And I had done a review of this, this angel tarot by uh, Travis McHenry. Travis McHenry, angel tarot. And I'm just throwing this out there for uh, those of you who weren't at that pledge level because I don't want anybody to miss out on this. Uh, I did a review of these cards. And the review is basically that they are amazing. I have always wanted... Can you guys hear me? Somebody says they don't have any volume. Can you guys hear me okay? Just checking. Can you hear me? Is there audio? Yes, okay, thanks guys. Okay, uh, somebody was saying they didn't have audio, so I didn't know if you guys could hear me or not. So um, this tarot, I have always wanted a angel tarot that wasn't horrible. Uh, to be honest, there's a bunch of them out there on the, the market and, and none, you know, I've went through a bunch of them and none of them were really good. You know, they didn't really have any of the correspondences that, you know, are associated with traditional magic or anything else. Well, I got these, uh, these were a gift from someone and they are amazing. And I wanted to bring up a couple of things. First, one of the things I love about these cards so much, I'll let you guys see them. You see the side is really nice, beautiful gold print. There's the uh, seal on the back of them. Try not to reflect the light. And uh, the angels are, um, the <laughs> Dale says, I'm sure they're wondering why there's a huge bump in sales. Um, so, these are based on the 72 angels of the shim operation. That's why they're so great. The guy who did the research on these, who put these together, first off, the, the artwork is not horrible at all, which is the case with so many of those old. Yeah, yeah. Vegas Vamp says it smells amazing. It actually does. It's got a really great smell to it. Um, but, you know, all of the, the old angel tarot cards were like these really – strange photoshopped uh, people with like wings on them or fairies around them or something like that. They just, they didn't look good at all. And they didn't have the traditional correspondences. These are amazing because they tell you they've got the angel's name. They've got uh, what the angel's name means. And they've got traditionally, you know, in addition to the, um, seals and symbols at the bottom. They've got what each angel was uh, traditionally invoked for. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's find a good one. So here's a really good one. Sihaya. Uh, and his name means God who took evil. And he is invoked traditionally for longevity and protects against infirmities. So these are 
um, the angels, 72. Seven, there's 78 cards, but it goes by the traditional 72 angels of the Shem operation. Uh, and there are six more major archangels. Well, I said, oh, and it also, it comes with this really great book. Tells you, you know, it's got pictures, tells you what the cards mean in readings, tells you how to use them in a reading, but it also tells you how to use them for invoking how to invoke the angel. If you want to use these like a talisman, you can use the card to actually invoke the angel. Use it like a talisman to get the angel's blessing on it. And then you can take the card around with you and, uh, you know, look at it throughout the day to, to keep yourself in contact with the energy of it, all of that sort of stuff. Um, so what else? The other thing that I wanted to, to talk about was how I finally got, I love them so much that I went ahead and got the other deck that he makes. This is another one by uh, Travis McHenry. And this one is called the Occult Tarot. And once again, it comes with this really great book. It's got all the pictures in it, but you can see already, look at those. Aren't those great? So those are the traditional pictures from the Goetia. Yes, Aiden. Yes, exactly. They are the Goetic deck. And you can see, you know, they're in this really nice red and black box. And they have, uh, you know, Solomon's seal on the back of them. And then the outside of these are shiny and red. And they have the, not only the, it's got just like the angel deck has the 72 angels of the Shem operation and then six archangels. This one has the 72 goetic demons. Let me see. I'll give you an example of one of them, a really good one. Uh, here's a really good one. This is Furfur. Uh, one of the 72 Goetic Demons. And for example, that's the artwork on it. So this is the artwork from the Goetia. You know, it's not just random stuff. So this one says, creates love between man and woman, creates thunder and great storms, gives answers on divine secrets. So, and these, once again, you can also use these... Here's the thing that I would suggest this. I, I would say if you're going to use these, if you're going to consecrate these and use them as a magical tool where you're going to use the cards for actual talismans, I would say get two decks, uh, one that you can actually use to do readings because they do also have. Uh, you can use them like tarot cards, you know, just straight up tarot cards like it tells you what card. Uh, each one of these corresponds to, like, for example, Baphomet is the magician. So all of them, you can use them like, I would get one if you're going to use it for a magical tool to get one that nobody else is going to touch, that you only use it for that purposes, for that purpose, uh, that, you know, it, then have the other one that you can use for readings. But now I want the, the another reason that I brought these up both the angels and the demons. Look at them together. Don't they look really great? Uh, the thing about the angels and the demons, there's 72 of each. Does anybody know why that is? I will tell you, it's because they're the same thing. They are both the same thing. You will hear in magic that it really doesn't matter if you take the right-hand path or the left-hand path. You end up at the same destination. That's exactly what this is. Both of them, all of them, all the angels and all the demons, they are first and foremost parts of you. They are parts of your own psyche, portions of your brain. But also they are they have astrological associations. So when you're looking at this now, here's the thing. The reason I keep bringing this particular diagram up and we're going to get to shielding in just a minute. But the reason that I bring this particular diagram up 
is because for me, this has been far, far more valuable a map in my own personal experience than the Quabalistic Tree of Life really was. The Quabalistic Tree of Life was okay for it was a, it was a perfect it was an okay map to um, yes Mike S that's a good thing that Mike S brings up he says my understanding is it is better to build the armor of God first before invoking the demons is that accurate absolutely that's that's the way I did it like I went through a month straight of invoking the seventy two angels of the Shem operation. Every day, it took me about three hours to go through it one time, and I would do it three times a day. And I did that. You can literally feel it feels like you are putting on a suit of armor made out of divine energy. After I did that for a month, then I started invoking the 72 Goetic entities the exact same way. But what they correspond to, what they are, are the... Uh, they're basically degrees of the Zodiac is what it is. So the reason, for example, that I say that this was more valuable to me in reflecting my own experiences as a map, uh, more so than the Quabalistic Tree of Life, is because, you know, you'll find people even now that are really confused about the Tree of Life. I, you know, you'll see people that add like planets to Kether and uh, Hakma. Like they'll say that, you know, one of them is Pluto and, and one of them is Uranus. And that is a very, very, oh, Kylie Ann says he has another deck where he matches an angel with a corresponding demon. That's really great news. I did not know that. So I'm going to have to get that deck now. But so what, going back to the Tree of Life for just a second, uh, what Hachma actually is are... These three rings right here. These all, you see how they all have zodiacal symbolism in them? So this first one, the first ring, that's right outside of Saturn. Saturn is Bana. Once you go past Bana, you go into Hakma territory. First, you have the 12 archangels of the Zodiac. Then you have the 36 angels of the deacons of the Zodiac. And then you have the 72 angels of the Shim operation. All three of those rings correspond to um, the uh, to Hakma on the Tree of Life. Once you get out here to the Imperion, see it says Imperion there. Imperion means the mind of God. Um, that is Kether, but there are also more veils above even Kether, where you're invoking, you know, like the uh, the highest one is Ein. And most people translate that as meaning um, nothing. Uh, it actually means no thing, not nothing as in nothing exists, but no thing as in it's beyond God. It's beyond angels. It is the source that everything eventually came from, you know, even Kether, uh, the entire tree of life. Before there was a tree of life, there was Ein. There was no thing. Uh, the way you get to no thing is you have to first go through Hakma. You have to invoke all of these 72 angels, all of these 72 goetic entities. And I, I'm going to say also, I don't even like calling them demons. You know, people call them goetic demons. I don't particularly like that name because it doesn't mean what most people think, you know, people who don't understand magic, it doesn't mean what most of them think when they think the word demon. Most people, when they think the word demon, are going to think of like fundamentalist Christian concepts of the word, you know, that have no redeeming qualities or anything else. Uh, if you notice the, if you get this deck, or even if you have a copy of the Goetia, if you start looking at what each of these are invoked for, you'll find that they all do incredibly beneficial things, you know, like they give you knowledge of this or they help you understand that or, you know, whatever it is. Um, you know, if something were that detrimental, you know, like the, the Christian concept of demons, if something were that detrimental, it wouldn't be interested in helping you in any kind of way. Even, it, you know, that's, that's talking about it as if it's an external 
thing. However, it's not an external thing. These are all inside you. When you invoke these 72 angels and when you, this is a map of your aura. This is how you complete the great work. Once you've activated all of these different levels, you have completed the great work. That doesn't mean there's no nothing else for you to do because you can always go further and further and further. Like in Zen, they call it polishing the mirror. And uh, you're even, you know, like the Buddha, after the Buddha achieved enlightenment, he didn't stop meditating. You know, he even after he achieved enlightenment, he would close himself off for weeks at a time, not talk to anybody, uh, not have contact with anyone where he would still sit meditation for weeks at a time, even after he achieved enlightenment. That's because what you're doing is even after you complete the great work, you are pulling more of that ein, or if you want more of the Empyrean, down into all of these levels, further purifying them, further strengthening them. There is absolutely no limit to the level to which you can purify and strengthen all of these levels. You could keep doing that forever. Uh, it's the man that I learned a lot from, the way he described it to me at one point, he said that it is possible even to reach a state that is beyond uh, the state that Adam and Eve existed in before the fall. We can go beyond even that, beyond the state that humanity existed in uh, whenever before they fell. There is no limit. You can continue to pull more and more and more of this down. And as, as a matter of fact, what we call God, this infinite source of energy from which everything comes, that's what it wants to do. That's its point and purpose. That's the reason it gave birth to the material world is because it wants to pour more and more and more of itself into the material plane of existence. You know, that, that's, that's what it's trying to do. This is where everybody wants to be. You know, this is where it's happening. This is, this is the place where we learn. This is the, you know, it's like in the Bible, they say uh, that after, you know, God creates this and that and this and that, then he gives uh, dominion of the earth to humanity, to mankind. That's because we are meant to pick up where it left off. It didn't really leave off because we are it. But we are meant to pick up where it stopped and we are supposed to continue the creation process. We are supposed to be perfecting this world. But 72 angels, 72 demons, they are the same thing, which is aspects of your consciousness, uh, aspects of your psyche, and aspects of your energy system uh, that you use to complete the great work. Let's see what you guys are talking about. Okay, guys, now I'm going to get started on talking about, uh, we're going to go over shielding tonight. So I'm going to cover up the, the comments just so that I don't get distracted while we're talking because you know that I cannot remember much of anything. Oh, one other thing I want to touch on about this. You know, one way that you can tell when someone has done this work is they will become what is called polymathic. Uh, a polymath uh, comes, the word polymath comes from uh, Greek and Latin. Like in Greek, it, mean, it means, it comes from the root that means having learned much. In Latin, it meant universal man. And I'm going to read you a definition real quick of what a polymath is. A polymath is an individual whose knowledge spans a substantial number of subjects, all known to draw, all known to draw upon. What is that? No, here it is. A polymath is an individual whose knowledge spans a substantial number of subjects and is known to draw upon complex bodies of knowledge to solve specific problems. So how does that relate to this? Because these represent parts of ourselves. For example, Mercury, that represents your intellect. That's the thought realm. That's your what some systems call your, your mental body. 
that's what Mercury is. Luna, that's your astral body. You know, that deals with un the unconscious, the subconscious, the dream realm, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, Venus above Mercury, that represents your emotional body. Um, you know, it goes all the way up. My point is whenever you are, what you're doing when you're strengthening these, when you're activating them and strengthening them, the more active they become, the more you will find yourself using all of those different levels of yourself. So a polymath, examples of polymaths would be uh, Leonardo da Vinci, um, Athanasius Kircher, uh, Isaac Newton, uh, Dante, all of these people were known to, I'll give you an example with Athanasius Kircher. He invented the very first uh, movie projector in the history of the world. He I mean, it was this huge giant box of a contraption uh, back in the uh, 1600s and it was, you know, giant, but it just had a little hole and you would press your eye to the hole and you could see a movie inside of it. Not only did he do that, but he's the one who diagrammed the shim operation. He was a ceremonial magician. So he's doing magic. He's inventing movie projectors. He invented what they called the cabinet of curiosities. A cabinet of curiosities is what would eventually go on to become the modern day museum. There were no museums yet back then. A cabinet of curiosities, they would collect all these different specimens, you know, like things from the ocean like starfish and shells and things from the world of nature like butterflies and birds and you know you would have anatomy you would have art all of these things in one room where you would it, you know they were only usually had by like royalty or wealthy people stuff like you know people of like the higher strata of society um but you would bring people into those and they would have their minds blown by all of this stuff that you would be able to point to and give them all this information about. Uh, you know, look at Leonardo da Vinci. You know, he's a writer. He's a painter. He was creating these floats in the parades for the, the tarot. Uh, you know, a, a poly, what the more you activate these different levels of your soul, the more you will begin to express them. So you'll be active in all these different levels and layers of life. If a person claims to have completed the great work, but they're not producing any sort of fruit, you know, they're not doing anything that, you know, that that would be the result of, uh, usually that's it, that means it's not the case. Um, could be a whole bunch of other different things, but nine times out of 10, if someone has activated, you know, a lot of things depend on stuff like your own karma and predilections and things like that. But nine times out of 10, uh, if someone has activated all the levels of the self, they will be polymathic. So, okay, now let's go into creating, uh, t creating shields, shielding and the aura. Uh, and I made some notes just so that I don't forget in the middle of what I'm talking about, because there's a lot of things I wanted to uh, go over with you guys. So I wanted to start with, you know, reminding you as above, so below. Everything on the energy level of reality is reflected on the physical material level of reality. So on the physical level of reality, you have a layer of protection for what is inside you. And that layer, that level of protection is your skin. Your skin is a pliable, pretty, pretty endurable. I mean, whenever you take all things into consideration, it lasts give or take 70 something years for most people, a lot of people. Uh, but it protects everything inside of us, you know, all of our organs, things like that. The aura is the same way. Just as your skin is the very last outer limit of your physical body, your aura, as it expands outwards, also has a level, a layer on the outside of it that acts very much like your skin. It's protective of all of the energy inside it. It provides a boundary. Just like your skin is the boundary of your physical body, it's the last level, so does your aura also have a boundary on the outside of it. 
Uh, and think of it, 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 you know, one of the reasons that people studied the physical world, you know, like all of these old alchemists, is because they realized that by studying the physical world, by studying the material realm, you learn a lot about the way the energetic realm works. Like one example would be your skin is not hard. You know, it's not solid. It's soft. It's pliable. The reason for that is because that makes it more durable. For example, if your skin wasn't pliable and you did this, then all of your bones would break through your skin. Your skin has to be supple. It has to be capable of dexterity so that we can do the things we need to do in the world. The same way with the outer layer of your aura. It's not like a solid chunk. You know, it's not like a, 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 a and in, what, what would be the word? You know, it's just, it's not solid. If it were, it would not be nearly as durable. It could be broken. It could be cracked. It could be shattered. So it gives just like your skin gives, you know, your skin is soft and pliable. So is the outside of your aura. Uh, and just like your skin protects your organs, you know, your internal organs, your, uh, your liver, your kidneys, your heart, your brain, all these sort of things. So too do you have energy centers and inner and and parts of your energy system that correspond to your organs. You know, like for example, with your heart, which is probably the the biggest one, the main one in the body, your heart energy center is Tipareth, you know, the gold center in the middle of your chest that corresponds to your physical heart. Just like your physical heart is pumping blood, you know, using veins and arteries to all different parts of your body, so is that energy center pumping chi, pumping energy to all parts of your energy system using meridians, just like your body uses veins and arteries to pump blood. Um, but, you know, like I said, that is, you do have that outer level, but that's you can increase the protection of that outer level because it's also kind of porous, meaning that things can saturate it. You know, that's why I always tell people, like, for example, energy is incredibly contagious. You know, for example, if you hang around somebody, if you hang around a group of people that complain all the time or that criticize other people all the time, eventually you're going to find yourself doing the same things. If you hang around people who are trying to elevate others, who are trying to, you know, work on themselves, improve themselves and and make a better world around them, then that's going to rub off on you, too. That's why they always say, like, if you wanted to be wealthy, hang out with wealthy people because you will not only start to learn what their habits are, but you'll take in their energy and start to mimic it because it's contagious. Um, I forgot what I was talking about. Uh, so I'm, I'll go over a couple of reasons why we use shields, you know, what they're useful for. And it's, it's a few purposes. Uh, number one is they prevent you from being saturated by the energy of places and the energy of other people. The energy of places uh, there was a Japanese scientist, and I cannot remember this the guy's name. I wish I could. He uh, did all of these experiments where he, he was the one who coined the phrase or coined the term morphic field. What a morphic field is, is like the aura of a place. And usually the aura of a place is made up of two things. One is the natural energy inherent in the earth in that place. You know, just like we have energy centers in our body, so too does the earth have energy centers in it. You know, for example, uh, they say when you're using the traditional Indian system of energy centers, you know, the chakras, there are seven main ones. This is why there are also seven continents on Earth, because each of the continents house one of the Earth's main chakras. Um, so places have auras. Every, everything, that, everything that exists that's made out of energy has an aura. 
and every single thing that exists on the material plane of reality is made out of energy. Science tells us that now. Therefore, every single thing that exists has an aura. So that's part of what creates a morphic field. The other part is people there. Whatever emotions that they're putting out, whatever energy they're creating, it will saturate and add to the morphic field of a place. This is one of the main reasons that I started practicing shielding when I was in prison. Keep in mind, I am in a building filled with thousands of people who have committed every heinous act known to mankind. You know, just one example for several years, the man who was in the cell next to me uh, was a guy who had crawled in through two old ladies' windows one night with a hatchet and hacked them to death with a hatchet because he wanted to steal their social security checks. Think That's one person. Think about thousands of people like that, all emitting that kind of energy, that level of energy. I didn't want that stuff saturating me. And not only like that, but you're also talking about even the people there who are innocent. You're talking about people who are living in terror because they have been sentenced to death or life in prison or whatever it is for something they didn't do. They see their days coming to an end inside this prison for something that they had no part in. The level of horror and terror, and fear, and trauma that goes along with something like that, all of that create also enhances the morphic field. So when I was in prison, I am basically in an ocean of every vile kind of energy, the most lowest, horrendous kind of energy that you can imagine. That's why I started practicing shielding, to protect myself from that stuff, because I didn't want to take it in. Um, oh, another thing I wanted to bring up, and I'm going to show you guys some pictures in just a second. They are, uh, they creating a shield is the way you protect yourself also from psychic vampires. Now, this is a, a thing that people go nuts whenever they hear about because they have these romantic idealized versions of what that is. You know, they, they tend to think, that whenever you hear the word psychic vampire, it means someone who is deliberately, knowledgeably, like drawing on the energy of other people. There are people like that. There are people that develop that level of magical capability, but they are very, very few and far between. More often than not, whenever we're talking about psychic vampires, we're talking about something... Uh, much, much more mundane and pedestrian. You know, most of them, most of the people who are real psychic vampires are unconscious of the fact that they're even doing it. And it comes from this feeling, they feel like they're incomplete. You know, they, they feel like there's a hole in them, like something is missing, like they need something outside of themselves to fill that hole. Some people turn to drugs or alcohol. Some people turn to uh, basically, I mean, you can really turn to anything to try to fill that hole. None of it will work. You know, ultimately, you'll eventually, for some people, it takes a long time. For some people, they learn it relatively quickly. quickly. But eventually, you realize that you can't fill that hole with anything outside of yourself. No person, no drug, no amount of alcohol, no amount of uh, anything that, that people get obsessed over. You know, people get obsessed over like having the latest thing, you know, like they've got to have the latest iPhone. Uh, people get obsessed with that kind of stuff, thinking it's going to fill this hole inside them. Well, most people that are psychic vampires, they feel incomplete or they feel this hole in themselves. So what they do is latch on to, they project onto other people that this person or this group, people do it with things like lodges and orders. You know, that's why people are so eager for, or covens, you know, in witchcraft circles. People are so eager, you know, they want to be part of those things because they, they don't realize you have everything in you that you need to do this work. They think it has to come from some outside source or outside people. 
Well, my brain went blank. Give me one second. Oh, so the thing about also whenever you do create a shield against psychic vampirism, you know, examples of psychic vampirism are things like people who are really, really needy. You know, that's a psychic vampire. Basically what they're doing all the time is trying to get your attention. And they can do it in a million different ways. You know, some people do it by creating constant drama, you know, conflict, arguments, uh, attacking other people, doing anything they can to get attention. Um, that That's a psychic vampire. Other people will try to seduce everyone that they come in contact with, make them like they want you to like them. Or it could be, you know, like that or it could be all the way to the extreme end, like literal like sexual seduction. All of it comes down to the fact, whatever form it takes, they are trying to get you to pay attention to them in some way. Because like they say, where attention goes, energy flows. You're feeding them your attention. So here's the thing. When you do, when you are aware that someone is draining you in a very detrimental way, you know, everybody exchanges energy with everybody. I'm not saying you don't want to exchange energy with anyone. But if it's detrimental and it's draining you in some way, then that's probably not a kind of relationship, whatever that relationship is, that you're going to want to continue. So one of the ways that you start to protect yourself and, and put an end to that cycle is by shielding. But here's the thing. Just like we've talked about in the past, how, you know, a lot of times when you do a ritual to gain something, you have to do something in the physical world to back it up. It's not like you can just create this magical shield around yourself and then keep going back to that person or back to those people and allowing them to keep draining. You You know, that that will not work if you have you have to take real world steps at the same time. If you know that someone is draining you, know, you know, if you're talking about one of the drama vampires, you know, it's constant, constantly creating conflict. I'm not saying you can create a shield around yourself and then go right back into dealing with that person in the same way, because what you're doing then is you're inviting them in. You're, you're feeding them your energy. If you're going to start creating these shields to protect yourself from those sorts of things, then you also have to break that contact, break that connection. Even if it's somebody that you still have to see on a daily basis, that doesn't mean you have to interact with them in the same way on a daily basis. You don't have to repeat the same patterns. Whenever you create this shield, in the beginning, you're most likely going to have to constantly hold it in your mind, reinforce it. Because when you first start doing this, if you don't hold it in your mind, it's going to dissolve, break down, and you're going to go right back into whatever the same situation was. Uh, the, the more proficient you get at it, uh, the less you, it's almost like there'll be a little part in the back of your mind that holds it up for you, that keeps powering it keeps generating energy into it so that you don't have to remain, you know, single-mindedly focused on it. Uh, But what will usually happen whenever those people realize that they're not getting energy from you anymore, they'll eventually move on. They'll go away. You know, even if you just like, if they start trying to create conflict or drama with you and you don't, you know, start arguing back with them, you don't feed into them. You just, here's it. Wayne Dyer, If you've ever heard of Wayne Dyer, he said one time, one of the the greatest things I've ever heard, he said he found that one of the easiest ways to short circuit that whole thing is no matter what the person is arguing about, no matter what they're saying, just say four words, four words, short circuit the whole thing. You're right about that. That's it. Whenever somebody's creating drama, whenever they're trying to start arguments, you just say, you're right. And you go about your business. Don't feed into it. Eventually, when you do that, they'll move on to someone else that will feed them energy. Um, oh, and I want to show you guys some pictures real quick. Uh, first off, I want to show you. Um, the first one is what a healthy aura looks like. 
versus what a damaged aura looks like. And I, I, I want to start giving you guys resources that you can go to to learn more about this stuff. These photos come from a book that when I was in prison, I found tremendously helpful. They, it was by a man named Joe Slate, S-L-A-T-E, J-O-E. Uh, Joe Slate, the book is called Psychic Vampires. Uh, Joe Slate actually worked for the military at one point doing a bunch of, if you've ever seen that movie, Men Who Stare With Goats, you know that the military has tried at some point to exploit just about every aspect of magic that they possibly could to try to give them an advantage in some way against other places. Joe Slate was one of the men who was involved with the military studying the stuff. So, oh, I'm first off, keep in mind also when I'm talking about these aura photos, I'm not talking about those things that are becoming popular in like new age shops now where you go in and sit there and they take a photo of you. And when they give you the photo, it shows you like surrounded with blue light or surrounded with red light or orange light or something like that. Uh, I don't know what those things are, but Joe Slate uses uh, Karelian photography. Karelian was a Russian scientist who invented a camera that could actually take photos of the um, plasma that is firing off around your body, your aura. So this, using Karelian photography, this is what a healthy aura looks like. These two are what a damaged aura looks like. So you see how there's not in starting in this one, there's not near as much light. It's broken. You even, when you get to over here, you see how, you know, not only is there almost no light at all, it's not nearly as bright, but there's also almost like chunks missing. That is literal pieces of an aura missing, like rips, tears, wounds. Your aura can be damaged not just from outside sources, but also from internal sources, like things like stress, uh, bad diet, uh, all of those sort of things also contribute to the health of your aura. As above, so below. The healthier your physical body is, the healthier your aura is going to be. My physical body right now, for example, is pretty damaged due to a lot of the trauma that I've been through. I'm trying to heal it right now. I'm getting better by the day, but it's been very, very slow going. There are times when I could feel that my energy system, my aura, barely extended beyond, you know, if you're really healthy, your aura is going to extend about arm's length. If you stretch your arms out in both directions, that's about how how much it's going to extend out from around you. You know, the, the closer someone is to, like I was a couple of weeks ago, literally close to death, your aura is barely extending beyond your physical body. It's grown very weak, very damaged. And that's what you're seeing in these pictures. Another thing he showed, he in Psychic Vampires, he... You know, like I said, people who actually know how to consciously take energy from other people, they're few and far between, but they do exist. And he did experiments with those people. He would have, he, he wanted to see proof of it. So he would have them take energy from other people's aura using breath work and visualization. That's all that it took them to do it. Breath work and visualization. And before they would start, their aura would be very dim, very diminished, very depleted. After they would do it, you would see that their aura would be lit up bright. While the person that they removed energy from had been greatly damaged. So he got photos of th this actually happening. He also goes into the book. The reason I'm talking about this and the resources is because he also goes into how to repair it, how to, and, and we're going to talk about that in just a second. That's one of the techniques I'm going to tell you in just a second for strengthening your aura and creating this shield. I used it when I was in prison all the time. Um, 
The other thing is when you do create a shield, it's not permanent. You know, I, I can't tell you how many people think, for example, you have to explain to them that when you charge a talisman, that talisman does not stay charged forever. You know, it's like a battery. You, you know, you wouldn't expect to charge your phone one time and your phone work forever. Or you wouldn't expect to just fill your, your gas tank of your car up one time and your car run forever on that one tank of gas. As above, so below. Everything on the physical mirrors everything on the energetic. Just like you have to recharge things on the physical level of reality, you also have to recharge things on the energetic level of reality. The more proficient you become at energy work and at creating these shields, the longer it's going to last. Normally, it, when I create one now, when I do it, I would say it probably lasts for probably 12 hours, you know, and, and that's just a normal, not putting a lot of strain and pressure into it. But, but I've been doing this, keep in mind for like 20 years. Uh, so I've come up with a, a bunch of different ways for, for strengthening it. And it's also just become a habit to me, like second nature. Before you get to that point, you'll have to reinforce it a lot more, which means you'll have to do these practices a lot more. You know, I would say do them three, four times a day. Um, the other thing is there are different kinds of shields you can create that does different things. So, for example, one thing you can do is create a solid shield around your aura. A solid shield is going to hold out pretty much all energy. All energy, all energy that you come in contact with, it holds it out. That may not necessarily be entirely beneficial. So you can do like uh, Kira, I saw her on here a while ago. She said something when we were talking about, remember when we were did, uh, a couple of weeks or so ago, I can't remember how long ago it was when we were talking about the invisibility ritual. You know, when I told you, I showed you in the Golden Dawn book, how they described doing it. They address the divine masculine, they address the divine feminine, and they address the energy itself and tell it what they want it to do. Uh, and then they create an egg around themselves, a black egg that is what actually causes the invisibility. And by invisibility, what we were talking about is that doesn't mean that if someone is deliberately looking for you, they're not going to find you. What it means is that people will tend not to notice you, like you'll pass without them noticing you a lot of times. Uh, she had mentioned about how she does it with smoke. Like when she, instead of a black egg shape, that she would do it as smoke. Well, you can do, and this is the other resource I want to give you because this book is really, really great. It is Psychic Vampires by Joe Slate. And here's another one. This one by uh, Michelle Bellinger. And it's called The Psychic Vampire Codex. A Manual of Magic and Energy Work. I can't recommend this book to you enough. I've, I've had this, I've probably given away at least 20 copies of this book. I bought them in, in bulk and would give them to pretty much everyone I know. I had this with me uh, the whole time I was in prison. And there's big chunks of it that is not going to be for everyone. Uh, you know, what I suggest is skipping, if you do get this, I would say skip ahead to, um, let me see what part it is. Uh, I would say skip ahead to um, section 11 called feeding and energy exchange, because that's where she goes into a lot of these techniques. Uh, you know, then if you, if then if you want to go back and read the beginning, you know, a lot of it is about like, communities and stuff like that which isn't going to appeal there's a lot of stuff a lot of phrases terminology stuff like that that isn't going to appeal to everyone but the actual workbook of the energy itself in here is just incredible she describes how she, it's almost like the smoke she calls it a filter and she's not the only one i mean that's a pretty 
common phrase. Uh, it's a pretty common uh, technique in the realm of magic to do this. The way that a filter is different from a shield is like we said, a shield holds out all energy. A filter is basically a shield that you create to hold out uh, specific kinds of energy or alternatively to only let specific kinds of energy in. So, and I, I'll tell you, first I'll tell you how to create the solid shield and then I'll tell you how to create the filter. But whenever I'm saying only letting specific energy in, the way you program these things is with intention. You set the intention that only certain kinds of energy come in. Like it can be only the energy of love or, you know, only beneficial energy, whatever it is that you're choosing to do. Um, let me see if there's anything else. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, the solid shield. First, uh, there's another thing I want to tell you about the solid shield and how to create the kind of ultimate shield, uh, which is what I would do when I was in prison. This is something if you have the time to do this, I highly recommend you take it to this level and practice this this more advanced version of it. But to create the solid shield, I'll give you two techniques. The first you do it exactly like we did the invisibility ritual. You stand with your eyes closed and you begin to inhale. As you inhale, remember when we do magic, we never use our own energy. We use energy we draw from outside sources. So we close our eyes and we begin inhaling. And as we inhale, we visualize, imagine that you're pulling chi you're pulling chi from the world around you, pulling energy from the world around you in the form of white light. Visualize it as white light. Every time you inhale, and, and through all cultures in the world, breath has always been intimately tied to energy. Every time you inhale and take in air, take in oxygen on the physical level of reality, you take in energy, uh, you take in chi on that energetic level of reality. You know, this has been known throughout pretty much every culture in the world. You know, that's why we have all these terms like ki and chi and ruach and prana. Uh, all of those are phrases for this energy that we're taking in every time we breathe. Whenever you visualize, you're taking in more of it. You're enhancing your ability to do it. So you stand with your eyes closed and you begin inhaling. Every time you inhale, you pull chi from the universe around you through your nose. It passes down through your body, out your feet, and into the center of the earth. See the entire earth below your feet fill with bright white light. Hold it. Whenever you exhale, the air goes out, but the energy stays in the earth. Inhale again and pull in even more and see the earth glow even brighter beneath your feet. Hold it. Exhale. The air goes out but the energy stays in the earth. Again, inhale, fill the earth with light. Now, you want to do this at least three times, at least three. But remember that the more energy you put into these things, the more power it's going to have. The, more, the longer it's going to last, the more durable it's going to be, the more you're going to be able to count on it. So when I would do it, I would inhale 10 times and fill the earth with light 10 times. And then, using the sword mudra, you hold your arm directly out in front of you at arm's length, and you begin to draw a circle of white light in the air. Turn 360 degrees. Draw a circle of white light all the way around you, and you connect it. Finish where you started so that you connect it around you, and you have created basically a hula hoop of white light around you. You're going to reach out with both hands with your palms up, and you're going to hook that light and you're going to stretch it, like feel it. Try to feel it stretch. You want to add tactile sensation to this. You want to feel like you're pulling energy up. Like it, you're, you, you, when you get good at it in the beginning, it'll only be visualization. But when you get really good at it, you will feel that energy move. Pull it up and close it above your head like a dome so that it's half of a white egg. And then put your hands back out to the side with your palms facing down and start stretching the energy again below you. Stretch it all the way down 
and close it beneath your feet so that you are in this white shaped, this, this egg shaped dome of white light. Have the intention that it's not brittle, it's not solid, it's flexible so that any energy sent at you, it can repel, it can bounce off, bounce back. You can either bounce it back to wherever it came from or you can just bounce it out harmlessly into the universe so that it doesn't penetrate you. Um, one other thing about that technique, the, the, what I was going to say about the advanced shield, like by far the most powerful one is I would keep in mind that going back to that map I was showing you all ago, the cosmological map or using the tree of life map, one of the things, and this is what I did find the tree of life beneficial for is it represents parts of yourself just like the cosmological map does. So you can create a shield of every sphere on the tree of life to protect every single level of your being. So for example, I always started with the white one. I would do the white one first. And then I would think, okay, Malkuth is the physical level of reality. So going up from Malkuth, what's the first sphere we come to? Yasad. Yasad is purple. It's the astral realm. So then I would inhale 10 times into the earth, filling it up with light again. And then outside of the white shield, I would do the same thing again. I would draw a purple line around me, all the way around me, that line of purple light. Then do the same thing. Catch that purple light and stretch it up above you, around the white shield, and close it above your head. Palms down. Stretch that purple shield below you, below your feet, so that you're encased now, one, in this white egg, two, in this purple egg. You go all the way up the tree like that. Where's what's next from your sod? Hod. Hod is the eighth sphere on the tree of life. It's your intellect. It is your mental body. So you inhale and fill the earth with light ten times, and outside the purple sphere, you draw an orange ring of light around your body and then close that, stretch it, try to feel the energy, stretch it, close that orange sphere above and below. From Hod, you go to Netzach, which is your emotional body. It's green, so you would draw a green ring of light. Close that around all those others. You go all the way up the tree like that. You go from Netzach to uh, Tipareth, which is gold, you go from Tipareth to um, Gebera, which is red. You go from Gebera to Hesed, which is blue. You go from Hesed to Bana, which is black. You go from Bana to Hakma, which is pearl gray or white. You go from that, from Hakma, to Kether, which is just brilliant crystalline light. And you put that around. So you have got 10 shields around you, all overlapping, all protecting you. So that's the way you create this kind of solid shield. That, you know, when I say solid, keep in mind, I don't mean brittle. It's still resilient. It still bounces energy back. But you are now protected on every single level of your being. Um, now, what I was getting to while I go about the filters and letting in certain kinds of energy. What you do then is you, instead of doing a solid line or a solid egg shaped dome, picture it as smoke and you do it the exact same way. Inhale, fill the earth, but when you're drawing it, have the intention that you're draw it's gonna be more porous. It's going to be more like smoke so that when energy comes, it doesn't bounce it off, it absorbs it. It absorbs all energy that comes towards you like a filter, and it holds all energy except what you want to penetrate you. So, for example, you could you could create a filter and say that it is you have the intent that it only allows the energy of love into you, or it only allows higher vibrational energy in. Everything else it absorbs, and then you ground it. You picture that shield, all of that energy that it's absorbed. Remember how we did the grounding exercises last time? 
that that was the first practical magic thing we did, you do the same thing with that shield. All of that energy that it's absorbing, that's not what you want, you ground it into the earth. Think of it as almost like this time you're encased in a sponge instead of in a balloon or instead of in an egg. So I'm going to give you two more ways really quick, and then I'm going to open this up for questions. I won't keep you guys on here long. I'm already starting to lose my voice. I'm losing my strength. Uh, but another thing that you can do is focus on the tip of rest center in your chest. Inhale, fill it with light. Do that 10 times. Whenever you exhale, see it radiate out through you and do it a little more each time. Inhale again, hold, and when you exhale, it pushes out even further. Inhale, hold, and when you exhale, it pushes out a little more. Inhale, hold, when you exhale, it pushes out even more until you've surrounded yourself with this egg-shaped dome of gold light that's anchored in your tip of breath center. Uh, that one, not only does it create the shield, but it also repairs any damages inside your aura. You know, it patches holes and stitches things up and closes breakages, all of that sort of stuff. Um, there was another one. Oh, and this one, this is a, kind of another more advanced technique. It's it's called, it traditionally in magic, they called it the, uh, the sign of the enterer doing this. But what you do is you do the same thing. You inhale and fill the earth with light. And after you've done it, say 10 times, you're going to use the sword mudra on both hands. You fill the earth with light. You step forward with your right foot and you thrust both hands with the sword mudra straight out in front of you, and you sh just sling all of that energy. Let it come back up through you, out your horn arms, and sling it. See it go all the way to the end of the universe. When it gets to the very end of the universe, picture it bouncing back. And as it's coming back at you, it builds up tremendous velocity, tremendous speed as it's coming back until when it slams into you, it completely wraps around you and envelops you and saturates you all at one time. So you're just taking as much energy in as you can, slinging it forward as hard as you can, seeing it bounce back off of the edge of the universe. And when it hits you, it just wraps around you, slaps around you and wraps. So practice, you can practice all of these and you will find that one of them probably uh, is going to appeal to you more than the others. For me, the one I do more often than anything else is the one where I draw rings of white light around myself and then stretch it above and below. All right, so I'm going to take this off so I can see what you guys are talking about. Who? Yes, yes, I see already Aiden is saying uh, there's room for customization at every level. It's all really about what feels right. That's exactly right. You will find uh, so much of magic is about your preference. You know, like some people prefer just to work with angels. Some prefer just to work with the goetic entities. Uh, it all depends entirely on what your personal preferences. Uh, Marilyn says, I have alarms on some of my shields. I even have a camera set up and an alarm that will go off. I'm super into shielding. One of my shields have a lock code on it so no one can mess with it. What she's talking about, like an alarm, for example, like you may not be aware all the time of energy that's coming in contact with your shield. If you set a intentional alarm that's to let you know that something you'll know then like something goes off inside you and you'll know that something is touching your energy your your shield that you're coming in contact with something that's that's bouncing off of it or trying to penetrate it yeah that is uh exactly that is a very good point that's that's true yeah let me see yeah, she says it alerts her. Yeah, it lets you know when something is happening. Exactly. And the thing about the camera, what that 
like when you do that, what it, what that's symbolic of is not only will you know that something is coming in contact with you, but you'll usually see, you'll get an image or you'll get a feeling or you'll get a sensation of who or what it is that's coming into contact with your energy. Uh, Glitch Witch says, how do you go about doing that? Just with your intention. That's really what it is. You, This energy, you know, this is the reason, like when you do magic, um, when you do magic, you don't have to tell the energy how to do its job. You don't focus on the middleman. You know, say, for example, uh, if you are, and I always use the example of money just because it's something everybody can understand. Everybody needs money at some point for something or other. When you do a ritual to, say, for example, be able to pay off a bill, you don't have to tell the energy how you want, you know, every step of the way, because the energy behaves as if there is an intelligence within it, a sentience within it. Uh, All you have to do is tell it the end result, tell it what you want it to do, program it. You're putting an intention in it and it'll take care of all the middle steps by itself. Don't think of the middle steps. Just think of what you want to happen. Same way with this. Just think, you know, you what you're doing magic with is your will. Um, let me see. Your friend Midas says, I'm feeling fear when I do the LBRP. Do I need to shield myself more correctly? Um, you know, that's... It's one of those things I don't know just because, you know, some people every now and then you'll come across someone who says they feel fear when they do these things. And it's usually due to some sort of like psychological issue, you know, like you were told like in the past that magic is evil in some way or it's bad in some way or something like that. And something something about that stuck somewhere in your psyche. So that's a thing that whenever people feel that, they have to figure out how to come to terms with that themselves. The, you, the thing is, you have to face that fear. That you, In order to overcome it, you have to integrate it. You have to figure out, why do I feel that? And you have to, you know, want, it's, it's like being scared of anything, you know, like people being scared of spiders. If you you know, first start looking at pictures of spiders and then start getting closer to spiders until eventually you can touch one and, and it doesn't, but yeah, Dale says education is always the best remedy for fear. Absolutely. Um, and education comes in a bunch of different ways, you know, just exposing yourself to, to it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, if you're doing, I mean, you're, when you're shielding, you're doing the same thing when, I, when you're doing the LBRP, you're learning a formula. You're doing the same. Oh, and that reminds me. When you do the LBRP, basically what you're doing is creating a shield around the room. You know how you walk around the room and draw that line of white light with the four pentagrams? You're shielding the room. That's all you're doing. Whenever you um, are doing it this way, shielding, you're doing it on yourself instead of the room. You can do it on your house. You could walk around your entire house and do that and close it, or you could also do it just visualizing, like lay in your bed, get completely comfortable, relax your body, and visualize that you are getting up out of your body and walking out your front door, And but you have to go through all of the steps. When you're outside your door, you inhale and fill the earth up with light, and while you're visualizing that you walk around your house and draw this line of white light around the house and then you close it above and below your entire house i do it around my building uh what was that well there was something else oh you can do it around things you can create shields around things you know around books around your cell phone around jewelry uh you can create a shield around other people there's absolutely no limit to um to what you can do with this, what all you can shield with it. You see what you guys are talking about. I'm going to wrap this up in just a second. Not going to keep you guys on here forever. 
Yeah. Oh, Daryl. Daryl Calhoun uh, says something, uh, an important question. He says, during the middle pillar ritual for about a week, I was feeling massive waves of energy during the final part of it where you wash your aura. The feeling has since diminished during the ritual. Is that normal? It is. It absolutely is. For some people, it diminishes. It takes a longer amount of time. For some people, it happens fairly quickly. But what it is, is your system is getting used to that you know, imagine if you hadn't eaten in days and you feel yourself getting really weak and really tired. And then all of a sudden you eat a meal and you feel your energy come back. You feel your vitality return. You know, you feel that it's very noticeable. But when you're eating, every, you know, three times a day, you don't feel that with every meal that you eat. It's because you kind of hit that plateau. You're, it's still having an effect. You're still strengthening your aura whenever you do that, but it won't be like as, as you know, maybe quite not quite as noticeable anymore. Yeah, Marilyn says she has shields on her Instagram. That is a very good idea too. keep the haters off. You know, you can create shields or you can create filters around your social media to help protect you from people, you know, just hateful people directing negative stuff at you all the time. Whew. Okay, yeah, Dale says hater shield. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay, guys, so I am, let me see, one more, what is this? Oh, Mike asked, how is the rice diet going? Um, so for those of you who don't know, I'm not sure what, what, where we talked about this at before, but I've been, basically my entire digestive system pretty much collapsed. Uh, and I thought I was dying a few weeks ago. It's been getting, you know, it started about two years ago. It got worse about a year ago, and then it got like seriously bad to the point that I thought I was even going to have to be hospitalized a few weeks ago. Uh, so I had to start eating a diet of only steamed white rice, like no, no butter, no salt, no sugar, no anything, just steamed white rice. And it's the only thing that my body can, can deal with. Like any other food that I ate was making it severely worse. And it turns out that I had, I, like I had, you know, my lining of my gut was worn away and it was leaking out into my bloodstream and affecting my nervous system. And uh, like my entire digestive system was super inflamed. So I had to start eating just white rice. And it is a very slow process. I'm, I feel like I'm clawing my way back an inch at a time. Um, but it is, it is getting much better. You know, I, I'm getting out of bed for a while each day. I, my strength is returning. It is getting better, um, just slowly but surely. Uh, let me see what you guys are talking about. So um, also, for those of you who don't know, um, there is a, I see a lot of you are talking about things. Um, there is a uh, study group on Facebook. If you guys want to pick this up and keep talking about, uh, yes, yes, your friend Midas says, hope we can do some energy work for you. I appreciate all of it you want to do for me. I will accept it all. Send it all to me. Um, but there's a Facebook study group where people are, uh, someone says I'm on, I'm on the Discord. I don't know what a Discord is, but I guess it's like another thing where people talk about stuff. Um, yeah, somebody else uh, says they're on the Discord. I don't know what Discord is. So if you guys know, let everybody know what that is and where it is uh, so that people can all... Um, Vegas Vamp says it's a show, social thing like an app. Yeah, Jen says it's an app. It's like a chat app. Yeah, Jen, Jen says Discord is better. So go to Discord. 
Is there, Jacob is asking, is there a link for Discord? If anyone has it, will you make sure that uh, everybody gets it to pass it through? Um, yes, it says there is an invite. So I'm going to let you guys deal with that. Uh, there's a Facebook study group. I think it's called like the Damien Eccles Patreon study group. And there is a Discord where you guys can go into this more in depth. Uh, you know, like Marilyn was giving some of the things that she does. Uh, I highly, highly recommend you guys trade ideas like that because it a lot of time inspires things uh, that can take you to the next level. Okay, guys, I'm going to shut this down because I am completely and absolutely exhausted still and need to uh, get back in the bed. Okay, I hope you guys are doing well. Thank you guys so much for being here with me. The, oh, the next one we're going to do will be on projecting and receiving energy. And that is probably my favorite thing to do, shielding and that. Those are my favorite things. Uh, and if you're on the next pledge level, uh, where we did the class on tarot last week, um, the next one we're going to do there will be about the Nephilim, uh, which is going to be, you know, that's another thing that I'm really passionate about. I don't mean the cartoon version, you know, like angels actually coming down and having sex with people. You know, that's no more accurate than like people who literally believe in the talking snake of Genesis. We're going to go into what it really means, what they really are, and what the significance is. Okay, guys, love you, and uh, thank you for being with me, and I'll talk to you later.